For hardware hacks for your wireless router, cool things you can do with a wireless router that's running Linux. Once upon a time, there's a greedy corporation full of capitalists. They decided to make a new product, and they called this product a home wireless access point or home wireless router. And it was intended to allow people to connect wirelessly to their internet connection. It would also provide a basic firewall to protect them from the evil things that were available on a place called the internet. These greedy capitalists in this big company were able to sell an awful lot of these things. After this product was released, it was discovered that the product was actually made with Linux inside. And that was good, because everybody here knows that anything that is made with Linux can also be improved with Linux. And so that's what I really want to talk about in this presentation. What you can do with a little bit of imagination with hardware that supports open source and, and free software. Specifically, wireless routers, because they're cool and they're inexpensive and you can find them just about anywhere. There are several other distros that will run on this class of hardware, but my experience is with OpenWRT, and I would expect you'd find similar things available in the other distros as well. One of the first things I really enjoyed about OpenWRT is the welcome screen when you log in. That's just about the friendliest console message I've seen. It actually works on an awful lot of hardware now because it did start with the WRT 54Gs and that class of hardware, but now it supports dozens of manufacturers and it's gotta be hundreds of different device names and device part numbers. This is a very legible list of all of the packages that are available on OpenWRT. So if you've got a little bit of imagination, one of my buddies at the uh, KW Linux user group has direct to telephone connections hooked up with his wireless router and it's able to support as many as two calls at a time. The hardware is a little bit limited, so it, it doesn't do very well with more than that. But if you just want to set up one real POTS telephone line onto the wireless router, that uh, it does that uh, quite well. With a little bit of imagination, you might end up setting up your own wireless access point to advertise your product or service, perhaps at a trade show, set up a, an echo of your company website in your trade show booth and take it with you to the trade show rather than paying for a really expensive live internet connection at your trade show booth. These boxes make amazing portable diagnostic devices. This is a, a box that you can easily carry in one hand. In fact, you could probably carry a dozen of them under one arm and deploy them around your infrastructure if you're looking for a particu particular failure in some of your systems or use it to temporarily segment your network and find out where a rogue device is operating. How about making a little miniature weather station and putting it in your backyard? If you go to the television and, and check out the weather for Calgary, what does it give you? Temperature at the airport? Temperature at the Husky Tower? Who lives in those two places? I don't care about the temperature at the airport. I want the temperature in my backyard. So why not get a temperature device, connect it to your Linksys router, put it in a little weatherproof box, or at least put uh, something over it to keep the snow off, and broadcast the local weather to the people within range of your wireless router. Why not? WRT 54G and GL, they actually have a couple of uncommitted digital I.O. pins. So if you want to play with electronics, and, and later in the presentation I do break out a soldering iron, that would be an ideal place to hook your, your temperature sensor. And then you can do it with a temperature sensor that's the size of a transistor. Here's an implementation I did for a friend. She has a couple of these uh, Logitech squeeze box music playing devices. And so these are network attached sound cards, essentially. They have little vacuum fluorescent display on them that'll tell you which song is playing. They need to connect to a server. So I took a wireless router, in this case it was a Asus wireless router, connected a USB hard drive for media storage and turned that into a music server for it. Instead of having a desktop computer on all the time to serve music or a laptop computer which would probably have some better use elsewhere. It just takes a USB hard drive, which powers down when it's not being used, and a wireless router, which draws about five watts of power, to act as the music server for these two music-playing network-attached sound cards. So she has music in different rooms that can draw from different uh, sources in the media files, or they can be synchronized and play the same thing at the same time. So how would you go about installing this custom software? Once you've installed OpenWRT on your wireless router, that's as easy as it is running a proprietary upgrade to the firmware on your wireless router. You can install OpenWRT just as easily. And once you're there, if you want to install Asterisk or some other open source package that you're interested in, it may already be packaged for OpenWRT. And installing is as easy as running iPackage update, list, and install for the uh, package that you want. If you have something a little more out of the ordinary that you want to do, they also provide a build root so that you can cross-compile and a complete SDK if you want to do something even a little more involved than that. 
Many of these devices do support USB and USB 2 even, so hooking up a hard drive to these things has become trivial. With the Linksys devices particularly, the version of the device does matter. Some of them are Linux-based, some of them are not. There were a couple of versions of this device, and they didn't change the version number or the packaging in any way, and it became harder to put OpenWRT onto these devices. So check the hardware compatibility list on openwrt.org before you go out and grab something specifically to put OpenWRT on it. Now we break out the soldering iron and look at a completely ridiculous but really fun hardware modification to a wireless router that I did. What we're going to see is a modification of the power supply, addition of a serial console and in fact two physical serial ports, and expansion of the memory in a device that wasn't intended to take a memory expansion. And as always, your warranty is void. I put an accessory power attachment in it so I could plug it in in my car. The power supply chip on the board will actually take a 43 volt input. That's nice because the electronic environment in a car can be a little bit hostile with the, uh, the voltage going up and down so much with cold weather starting and temperature being so widely variable, especially in an environment like Calgary or Toronto. As nice as the power supply chip handling the 43 volts, they built it with capacitors that can't handle 43 volts, but they did handle 25 volts. Maybe it's not ideal for a car, but I, it hasn't blown up on me yet. The device I'm using doesn't have proper power management, so you can tell it to reboot and you can tell it to halt. All it does is reboot because it has no way to shut itself off. I always thought it'd be a neat hack to build a little circuit that would give it that ability to power off entirely. I also thought it'd be pretty cool to connect it to accessory power rather than leaving it always powered through the cigarette lighter in, in uh, my vehicle. Again, mileage in your car may vary a little bit. And I put together a little circuit. This circuit is for the serial port and the memory expansion that we're going to do in this wireless router. And what you see here is a uh, level shifter chip that takes the 5 volts from the circuit board and converts it to 12 volts that's used in the RS-232 communication uh, standard. And we've also added a, a socket for an SD card. We're gonna expand the memory of this device with the addition of an SD card. That's what the circuit board lay layout would look like on the PC boards that I designed. All of these source files are available on my website. And then it came to deciding where to put those RS-232 connectors on my wireless router. Because I'm the type of guy who likes to use the tools I had at hand, I first tried to cut out the holes using my soldering iron. Now this is a real opportunity for you to learn from somebody else's mistakes. Somebody else's mistakes will make your kitchen not smell as bad as mine did. <laughs> okay, soldering iron and the plastic they use in these enclosures, not a good combination, just saying. So I took another shot at it. I've got a few of these routers lying around. A um, good friend of mine runs a machine shop and he's got millions of dollars of computer numeric controlled uh, lathes and uh, milling machines around. And I was able to talk him into um, cutting out some nice cutouts in these uh, enclosures for me. And so if you happen to have a million dollar uh, 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 milling machine around, you can cut out uh, connectors like this. So I uh, sent out the circuit board order to a, uh, a mail order PCB place that I've used before. And this is what the circuit boards looked like when they came back in. Um, I had them perforate between the two sections, on the left side you see the serial adapter and on the right side you see the um, solder pads for the uh, memory card socket. And that's what it looks like once it's slightly assembled. There were a couple of adjustments that had to be made to the, uh, the wiring and that has been updated in the, um, the source files for the circuit board and, uh, and the schematic on the website. So you won't have to use the jumper wires that I used. Now to make the serial port modification work, the Linksys is configured for one serial port right away for a serial console. So if you plug into their bare solder pads, you can actually watch these routers boot up, which is pretty slick if you, if you want to do some troubleshooting in the, in the boot mode. Um, I wanted to have access to that with a serial port, but I also wanted to have a second port and be able to choose the baud rate that was being used on that second port. I had to change the configuration of BusyBox and recompile that and then load that onto the router. It uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't that difficult to do. Even, even a clown like me was able to get it to work properly, so you should be able to get it to, to go as well. And then I modified a GPS antenna that I have. So it came with a, a PS2 connector on it. it was a, it's basically a serial connection device. I wasn't able to find the matching connector, so I changed it to a DB, uh, DB9 connector so that I could plug it into the uh, serial port that I was adding onto the wireless router. And then I configured the 
second serial port on the router for 24, uh, 240 baud, uh, same as the um, serial antenna or the GPS antenna. Now I wouldn't have to do that because the GPS antennas are available in USB and that would be a lot easier. Wouldn't have the smelly connector cutter thing issue happening. Wouldn't have to change the connector on the, uh, on the GPS antenna either. That's one of the drawbacks of being an early adopter. Sometimes you have to break, break your own trail. This is what the SD card edition looks like on the Linksys board. It's a little scary. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for somebody who hasn't soldered before. There are only six wires to connect, but you're soldering onto a surface mount board that's already populated with surface mount components. The soldering is a little bit fussy. My suggestions are use a small and hot iron, test your continuity on each of those connectors with your continuity tester, and then test them as well with the general purpose I.O application uh, a tool to uh, test connectivity in the uh, system as you go. Putting together the socket for the SD card was a little bit tricky. Getting the SD card to work was a little more involved than getting the serial port to work. It was a matter of loading the correct MMC module, getting the file system support loaded as well, and then figuring out the incantation to mount the file system, and all of a sudden you've expanded the 32 meg of uh, flash into something much larger as available on your SD card. I had trouble with finding an SD card that was compatible. If it looks like you're following all the steps and you think it should work and it just ain't, try a different manufacturer on the SD card. And that's what it looks like when it's assembled. That's a 256 megabyte flash card because that was the latest and greatest when I, when I did this. That may put a, uh, a date on, on when this was done. Kismet is wireless survey software, so it listens to uh, broadcasting wireless access points and retrieve some information about them. Signal strength, uh, signal to noise ratio, um, and when you've got GPSD connected as well, if Kismet knows its location, it'll, it will tell you where you were when you were able to hear these access points. Kismet had uh, three different modes to concern yourself with, client, server, and drone, and they all worked as advertised for me. Just a matter of setting your logging directory and deciding what information you want to save in your log. Now with larger storage cards uh, or the ability to connect to a big USB device, you could save everything essentially. I trimmed the logs down a little bit because I was only limited to the 256 meg that I had saved. I believe I SSH'd into this to, uh, to get the result on screen. And it shows a couple of different access points that it was connected to, the channels that they're operating on. So if you do choose to drive around, you can get a little bit of information about what wireless uh, access points are, are in your neighborhood or around your campus. If you're surveying to see if there are any unauthorized wireless users visiting your company's property. Does, does the Kismet software find um, Wi-Fi that are not broadcasting SSID yes. as well? Mm -hmm. Because they still have to broadcast. And if they're in a conversation with somebody else, they'll see that that conversation is going on. And if a client uh, joins the network um, when you're in range, the client device will actually disclose the SSID anyways, and so you'll be able to parse that in and fill in that blank. Do that communication is it? Oh, hell no. I can show you later after my talk. <laughs> Once you put the RTC on there, power monitoring would be a quite nice thing board to do so that you can put like a mesh route and system up beside the panels of batteries and it can self-monitor itself and de-advertise when it's running low on battery. Fantastic, and, yeah. Yeah, be time aware so it knows that the sun's coming up in an hour. That would be cool. The options that you could uh, get into with, with something like this, it only draws uh, five watts. Uh, put a little solar panel on it. Uh, give it a little backup battery and put it in a weatherproof box and, and do data collection with it. Maybe this isn't the ideal tool to do all of those things, but it's a tool that you can go and pick up at the local big box store. You can be working on it in your basement in 20 minutes. It's got, with, with decent antennas, it's got a decent range. A couple of years ago, the DEF CON uh, wireless shootout that did, uh, from, basically went to another state. Those are the guys who went mountain, mountain top to mountain top across the Arizona desert. A thousand feet up the side of a mountain and shot into Utah. No. No, same, same radiated power, you're just using better antennas. Oh, well, they're using the big 19-foot satellite dishes. One thing is don't necessarily limit yourself to the Linksys stuff. There's a lot of stuff that's compatible with DDWRT and OpenWRT. Yeah. My personal favorite is basically there's an Asus uh, WL500GP. That, oh, yeah, G, GP. 
put in the balls. Yeah, um, like this one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice thing with that one is you open it up, you can replace the crappy Broadcom radio with a real Atheros one that Kismet plays nice, much nicer with. It's got two USB ports, so you've got one for a USB stick for storage, one for your USB GPS. So literally, all the hack that you have to do on this thing is software. The only thing you have to do is undo four screws. So none of the problems of, of you know how to mount serial ports in cases and stuff like this. So it's yeah. The hardware that's available now gives you not an awful lot more options than were available when it was just the Linksys uh, WRTG. Ubiquiti makes the uh, rudder station, yeah. uh, which is basically when anything on steroids, you know, much faster processor, more RAM. Uh, it's got USB, but it's got like three mini PCI slots in the thing. So you can do, you got three radios in the thing. You know, imagine the stuff you can do with that. So. Thank you so much for, uh, for participating as well, Brad. Um, any further questions before we wrap up and get ready for Brett's presentation? The circuit board information is all on my website, and if you want to know more about OpenWRT, they have really good forums, really responsive community as well, and I highly recommend playing with OpenWRT if you are at all interested in playing with wireless routers. Thank you so much. Good to see you.